do it to the computer. Right. Okay, Off welcome everybody and sorry for the delay, but here we are. And I'm Gabby Judd from Grandmothers for Refugees, New South Wales, and with me is Barbara. So I'll just hand over to Barbara to do the basics. Okay. Um, first of all, can you please keep yourself muted through right through the session? Um, and at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat box. I have already put Jason's um, nation box uh, URL down there. So if you'd like to make a donation to Forsaken Fighters, which would be great, um, links down there. Uh, if you wish to ask a question, can you please put it in the chat box and I will um, address them as we want to answer questions as you go along, Jason, or would you rather put it at the end? Yeah, I think it's uh, best to just answer the questions as they come along and, uh, and I okay. can sort of add to it as we go. Okay, well, I'll let you know when there's a a question there so you don't have to worry about it um as i said uh, for second fighters would be delighted to receive donations and the url link is down in the chat box so keep yourself muted and um off you go gabby okay i'd like to um acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the lands on which I'm meeting, uh, which is Hornsby, uh, acknowledge the people of the Darug and Gurungai tribes. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work and live today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Stra Strait Islander people participating in this meeting. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land and waters um, of New South Wales. Okay, so I'd like to say Henry, thank you. Can I just interrupt? I'm really sorry. I forgot to say to participants, the session is being recorded. So if you don't want to be um, recorded, can you turn your camera off? Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. I'd like to say a big thank you and welcome to retired Captain Jason Skeynes and founder of Forsaken Fighters, who he'll tell us a bit more about today. Since returning from fighting in Afghanistan for the past five years, Jason has been campaigning relentlessly and lobbying our government to bring his interpreter Hassan and other interpreters as well from Afghanistan to safety in Australia on protection visas. Now I'll hand over to Jason, who will fill us in on the campaign, and we're especially interested in what the um, situation is for Hassan at the moment. Because many of the grandmothers actually supported Jason and Hassan in court, um, I think, at early last year. So thanks, Jason, and I'll hand over to you. Oh, thanks very much, and thanks for having me. And uh, my apologies for being a little bit late. The daylight savings time up here in Queensland has... Uh, has thrown me, but um, nonetheless, uh, I'm here and, and you're right, I've been campaigning for um, going on eight years now for the Afghans since I got back from Afghanistan myself and I spent uh, 10 months there on a forward operating base. But um, we've been advocating and, and thanks very much for all of the grandmothers for refugees who uh, turned up uh, in great numbers down in uh, Sydney at the federal court hearing, which was just really great to see that there was uh, some support out there uh, for me. And I wasn't the only one pushing this uh, wheelbarrow uh, because it, it felt like a long, hard battle. And unfortunately with uh, Hassan's application, uh, we're going back to the federal court. Uh, so we filed um, in relation to the latest decision uh, that came out uh, in regards to Hassan and his, his uh, young family. Um, so, he is uh, in great danger still in Afghanistan. He's moving around all the time um, and uh, he needs as much support as, uh, as we're able to give him. Um, more broadly, uh, moving away from Hassan's case. So that'll, unfortunately for a lot of the people in Afghanistan, uh, people like Hassan, uh, this process is not a quick process, whether it's uh, through the Lee visa um, program uh, whether it's uh, getting visas, whether it's those that have got visas now trying to get out, uh, or whether it's uh, pursuing uh, court action um, against some of the decisions made by government. None of those, unfortunately, are quick solutions uh, to getting people out and to safety. And that remains our 
our uh, largest priority. I've got a list uh, which I updated a couple of days ago uh, of over 600 uh, people uh, that's mostly Afghan interpreters and other aid project workers that assisted the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Government in Afghanistan over that two decade campaign. Um, many of those uh, are still remaining and we have about 150 of those individuals have visas. Uh, so they're still in country. They have a valid Australian visa, be it uh, a 201 um, humanitarian, in country humanitarian visa or a 449 um, protection visa. Um, there's about 150 that we have on our books uh, still remaining and around 600 all up that are waiting for um, for a visa. So the situation remains pretty concerning and dire um, for those individuals over there. And, and because we're not seeing a lot of what's going on in the media, um, I'm getting uh, constant reports. Uh, I've got a large group that I'm looking after um, on the ground there, and they give me constant reports and updates each day uh, of what's going on on the ground in Afghanistan. And uh, because it's out of the public eye and we don't see it, uh, doesn't mean that bad things aren't happening. And, and I can tell you that uh, the situation remains very concerning, um, particularly for our interpreters. Um, and those interpreters come with their wives uh, and their young families. And we remain extremely concerned for them because the Taliban are conducting search operations um, throughout certain districts uh, within Kabul and Kandahar and other places. Um, they're now ordering um, people that they've found um, had an association with um, coalition forces, ordering them to attend a Taliban court. And if they don't attend that uh, court, then uh, the punishment um, falls to their extended family that remains in Afghanistan. So the situation is very concerning for those, even those that are here that have extended family um, still remaining in Afghanistan. So we're trying to do all we can to help those that are most vulnerable. A lot of these people uh, fled their homes in um, as Herat and Kandahar were falling and uh, fled to Kabul. Um, a lot of them packed up and, and left everything behind. Uh, they've now been waiting for a couple of months uh, in uh, other places, hiding in hotels and and the like, and they've got young kids and families, uh, their wives and stuff with them. So we've been trying to um, get financial aid uh, directly into those uh, those people. So we do 100% rely on donations because unfortunately I can't uh, I can't fund that myself. I left my my job as the um, the CEO um, of a large commercial club here a number of years ago to take up the fight uh, to basically show that money wasn't a motivating factor for me. Uh, I was doing this on principle, uh, and that is the, the principle that uh, we look after our mates, we don't leave our mates behind. So, yeah. Has anybody got any questions that they would like to ask? Jason, I, I thought that Hassan's family were in... Um, um, Pakistan, I think. Pakistan, yeah, they've gone back yeah. to... Yeah, so yeah, look, he's, uh, Hassan remains um, in hiding, so his location I, I can't um, disclose, yep. but I am yep. in constant contact with him um, for his own safety. And um, we do try to, uh, wherever I can, uh, get financial assistance into both Hassan uh, and to other. And we're not just looking after um, interpreters. I, I've got a number of aid project workers um, and, and people that are on my um, priority list that are extremely vulnerable there. And I've got uh, one lady who's um, extremely vulnerable because she's separated from her husband. Um, she has a, a, a young son and she's currently uh, in hiding with her mother, her young son, her sister uh, and her sister's partner. So, you know, there's a, a basically a group of, uh, of females there with a, a child and one male attached. And, um, you know, they're, they're extremely vulnerable because she is separated uh, and that. So we're actively trying to get her out at the moment. She has a, a 449 visa. Um, the problem is uh, she either needs to get to Pakistan to get assistance or um, we need to be able to get her out of, um, out of 
Kabul or, or those areas where she might be. Uh, and that's quite expensive now. So flights previously out of, let's say, Kabul to, um, to Pakistan were only around $250. Um, now we've seen that those prices spike and they're around $1,200 to $1,500 US for one ticket one way. So, mm. um, you know, when you've got four or five, six people in a family unit, that's a lot of money um, to, try and, uh, to try and get people out to safety. Um, if we can get them to Pakistan and they have a valid visa and passport, um, I've been assured that the Australian government will uh, be able to take care of those, um, those people and, and action their visa to get them here. But at the moment, it's, uh, the advice is that they should remain where they are in Afghanistan. Um, they shouldn't try to cross uh, borders uh, but certainly if they can get a visa for Pakistan and they have a passport and a, a valid visa for Australia um, and we can get them there, uh, then we will we'll do that. How easy is it to get a visa for, for Pakistan get, and then to get out of Kabul? Are the Taliban letting them get on flights to Pakistan? Yeah, if they've got visas, um, it's, it's still obviously any sort of movement. Look, remaining still in Afghanistan is a danger. Um, you know, we're getting uh, sent video footage of the Taliban conducting um, night searches and raids on, on houses. Uh, and so people are ab absolutely living in fear, watching the neighbours across the road, uh, their properties being searched and those individuals dragged out. And I guess probably waiting for when it when is it their turn, when are they going to be... Uh, searched and, and and everything so they are absolutely living in fear any anything in Afghanistan is dangerous remaining still um, any movement uh, navigating Taliban checkpoints crossing borders or getting on flights anything is dangerous so uh, it's really up to the individuals to make those assessments uh, on the ground of what they're comfortable and safe uh, feel safe in doing um, and where possible we can provide as much assistance as we can Thanks, Barbara. I think we've got we have, a few messages yeah. in the chat. Yep. How do we respond to requests from people in Afghanistan for help in obtaining visas and help completing application forms? Yes, uh, there is a lot. Um, look, there's there would have to be over 100,000, I think, applications of people wanting to uh, get out of Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, there's 39 million people in Afghanistan and um, a lot of those would, will be uh, vulnerable people. Um, unfortunately, we, we won't be able to help all of them, uh, but certainly uh, we want to make sure that we look after the most vulnerable. And that's, you know, our interpreters, their families, their women, uh, their children, uh, and those type of people that are actively being hunted uh, by the Taliban. Um, and the reprisals that are taken out against uh, these individuals if they're captured are very uh, public displays um, and they're very barbaric. Uh, they're not things that you can, uh, that are really for public consumption. So um, it is, you know, the conditions that they, they face uh, are quite extreme. So uh, we're very, remain very focused on trying to work with government uh, and other agencies to, to get these individuals to safety. But um, in regards to how many, how do we help people process applications um, and the requests, how do you respond to the requests uh, from people? I, I guess it's very difficult because there is such a high volume of requests coming out and, and we've had to try and sift through a number of those requests to make sure that the people that we're um, trying to assist um, are first of all verified that we have their documentation. Uh, we've verified that they've worked for the Australian government or defence force. Uh, or uh, aid project workers, and we have documentation for that. Uh, and then we step through, um, we have a number of um, legal migration agents uh, that are able to assist. But um, in the greater context, the ASRC, I know uh, CON down there does some fantastic work and they're trying to address this issue more broadly uh, with assisting um, people to fill out application forms. Um, so it is, um, you know, it is, these guys um, will try and attach themselves to anyone um, to try and get help. So they may have, they may contact you, but they may have contacted 30 other people at the same time and, 
Um, and it's really trying to deconflict um, who's helping who. Otherwise, you might have 20 people working on the same, on the same, trying to organise the same person. So it's really hard to deconflict that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, Isabel, you said question from Isabel, but I can't see the actual question. No, um, I, I didn't give you the question. I just did, did can you put it in the chat and then we'll we'll ask it. Okay. Thanks. Um, Marion has said on SBS News yesterday, it was said thousands of Azar people had been expelled from their homes um, by the Taliban who claim they have no right to live there, are now homeless and got nowhere to go. I think that's more of a statement. If you'd mm. like to comment on that, Jason. Yeah, look, at the, obviously the Hazar, um, Hazar, there is, you know, um, probably more persecution towards uh, the Hazaras uh, there in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I, I don't like to, to pit um, one against the other. And I, I think there's, um, you know, any, anybody that's, uh, that's in Afghanistan that has a possible association with any coalition force elements uh, would be at considerable risk, regardless of whether they're Pashto and Hazar or Tajik. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of that there. So yeah, it is very concerning. You know, we had reports of a of a lady um, cradling her seven month old baby in Ghanzi um, a few weeks ago uh, was shot and killed. You know, so it's uh, it is really disturbing uh, what's going on over there at the moment, and there's very little uh, media coverage of that. Yeah. Um, Roxanne has asked, um, what are the realities prospect at the moment for travelling overland from Kabul to Islamabad? Yeah, the, the reports that I'm getting is that the borders are now uh, have been closed. Um, some people are, um, other countries are issuing freedom of movement um, passes through the, um, Pac the government of Pakistan. Uh, through the Ministry of Interior there. Um, they're providing um, freedom of movement uh, passes through the Torkham border. That seems to be working for, uh, for some, uh, some uh, countries, but obviously Australia's uh, position is that we're, uh, we don't want people moving about because they're exposing themselves to greater risk. But uh, as I said before, uh, anything's a risk in Afghanistan and even remaining still and, and in hiding where you are um, can put yourself at risk. So those individuals need to make that assessment themselves. But look, I, I think the borders uh, at the moment are, are tightly controlled. Previously, uh, those people in Kandahar and other places could travel down through Spin Baldak uh, and across the border into Quetta on nothing more than a Kandahar Tasquera. Um, I believe those borders uh, have now been tightened up uh, and have closed and you need a valid visa um, or a very good reason to get into Pakistan um, now, so it's, it's very difficult, I think, and um, for people to try and get there through uh, over land. Right. Um, thank you. Wendy has asked, do you have any sense of why the Australian government, federal government, is dragging its feet in relation to these people? No, look, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're going through the, uh, and, and just before I, I got on to this, I'm actually uh, in the throes of uh, drafting up the Senate submission, which is due tomorrow um, from us. And you know, part of that will, will I suppose, form, uh, will come out in, uh, in those sort of um, assessments. Uh, but there's certainly um, a lot more that could have been done and should be done, you know, that particularly our response with a cap of 3,000 positions um, is, is pretty low. Uh, and we haven't seen the government uh, wanting to move to increase that cap. Um, we absolutely um, implore the government to um, increase that cap um, to something more that is more fitting of the crisis that is unfolding uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and 3,000 doesn't really uh, cut the mustard. We can do a lot better and we can help a lot more uh, if we increase that that cap. Absolutely. Um, mm. Jeffrey has made a statement, but you might want to comment on this. Um, he says visa and passport, many don't have passports. And I presume it's fairly hard to get yeah. one now. Yeah, it is. And that's, you know, it's a really good point. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of these individuals, um, you know, they don't have passports or their passports have expired. 
um, you know, this uh, crisis that we, we've sort of started hearing about in the last couple of months had been unfolding for, you know, since early this year. So a lot of those people um, have been unable to get passports even before um, some of the major capitals uh, started falling. Uh, and certainly now, I believe that the, the government is starting to do that. But a lot of those people that may have had an association with coalition um, forces or elements will be very uh, guarded about going to a government, uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, um, Afghan government agency to obtain a passport for a number of reasons. And we've, uh, we've seen reports that the Taliban have access to the biometric machines uh, and that could include uh, the data from those uh, those biometric uh, collection um, data. Now, if the Taliban don't have the um, the the ability or capability to access the stored data, uh, biometric data on a lot of those individuals, certainly the Pakistan uh, ISI would have that capability. So uh, people will be very reluctant to go to government agencies to try and obtain uh, passports. And that makes it very difficult then uh, for those individuals to travel uh, out of Afghanistan. That's to try and get across the border because A, they can't get a visa, they don't have a passport. Uh, so it makes, makes them really reliant uh, on action from the Australian government to get them out to safety. Yeah. All right. Um, Roxana has said, you know, if people trying to get flights from Kabul to Islamabad, with Pakistan visa and passport are being interrogated about reasons for leaving. Yeah, well, we're, we've, uh, our advice is if, if people are trying to uh, get down there to obtain a flight, uh, to try and get a, a tourist visa. Um, and, you know, the Afghans are, are pretty good at, um, and they will, of course, be uh, interrogated, I would imagine, um, of why they're travelling and where they're travelling and all the, the normal things that go with a, things like a tourist visa. Um, and, and I guess they really need to, that's why we're saying that they really need to make those decisions for themselves. Some are very good at, uh, at being able to provide responses and reasons for, uh, for that with the Taliban. They're quite confident um, in doing that. Um, others are not so confident and, and that's really up to the individual to make those assessments. Uh, of what, what they're comfortable with doing. Right. Uh, Jeffrey has said, I've been submitting forms 842, 696, uh, and copies of ID and sending by express mail so that ev evidence of receipt is there. Um, I don't, yeah. It's not actually a question yeah. for that. But, yeah. oh, they're, look, they're huge. They are huge forms. They're, they're very onerous um, applications, the 842, um, I think is a, from memory a 36 page um, mm. document um, and generally uh, you know they were for the interpreters uh, one of the issues we have is that they they made fill out a leave visa application which is a 10 page um, document uh, they then directed to fill out a form 80, uh, uh, form 80 which is a 20 page document and a form 842 which is a 36 page document so by the time they've navigated 70 80 pages of uh, plus supporting documentation and evidence, um, you know, no other individual goes through that type of um, vetting to come here to Australia that these interpreters are being put through. So, um, you know, it's very, it seems to be uh, a very rudderless and xenophobic, um, I guess, policy that's sort of wrapped in a big fat ribbon of bureaucracy. Yeah, sounds dreadful. Yeah. Um, Alan has said, how secure do you feel your communications are with the Taliban people? Um, from the Taliban people, sorry. How sophisticated are their cyber resources? Yeah, look, they, uh, we, we've just recently transferred a lot of people that we had on a WhatsApp group uh, to a more secure means uh, on another uh, platform. But, um, you know, because we got word that um, the Taliban had the uh, capability to... Um, to get into things like WhatsApp and messages and uh, and all the other sort of plat social media platforms, so we've we've transferred to a more secure um, platform to protect those individuals, and um, we've done up a nice little um, checklist for them. You know, if the if searches are happening, uh, what they can do to um, to try and hide their information and uh, and those sort of things, so that an association can't be established. 
Um, so yeah, but I believe that their capabilities are reasonable, um, you know, but they're not uh, they're not fantastic, and that's why the the bi biometric data that's uh, that may be compromised. Um, as I said, the Taliban probably won't be able to uh, don't have the capability to access that, but certainly um, working with uh, Pakistan ISI uh, would more than likely have that capability. And that biometric data is very extensive. It's um, you know, generally includes iris scans, uh, fingerprints, um, you know, very uh, family extension, um, family networks, uh, right down to your favourite food and your favourite colour. Uh, so it's very, uh, the data is uh, very comprehensive. Mm. Okay, um, Isabel would like to know, how are the people who are living in fear from finding food? If they can't stay with extended family, who can they stay with? Yeah, exactly. And you know, this is what this is the problems that we're trying to to help our guys and their families with um, is providing that direct financial support um, to those individuals on the ground. Um, and we've got a number of ways. Uh, the Afghans are very, um, I suppose, clever with coming up with um, new ways on how to get um, things into Afghanistan. So when the banks weren't operating, when MoneyGram and Western Union weren't operating, uh, we still had. Uh, the ability to get uh, funds uh, in there to Afghanistan directly to uh, the people that needed it. So um, it was, and that's only through uh, the network of Afghans that I have here in Australia that were able to um, assist me in providing uh, that direct support. So that's exactly what we're trying to do is people that have fled, um, that may be living in hotels or staying with other people that have families that can't get food or can't pay their bills, um, you know, we're trying to assist those people financially and um, and there's a lot of people like that at the moment. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, Jane would like to know, or says, thanks so much, Jason, for your long-term commitment, Afghan people. The government can't say they don't know of the dangers and it makes it outrageous, outrageous bungling of exiting Afghanistan more outrageous. Another comment, and I think we'd all agree with that. Yeah. Um, oh, look, it absolutely is. Uh, we wrote to the government on the 20th of April um, this year, uh, urging the government, uh, so with the announcement of the withdrawal of the coalition troops from Afghanistan by September, um, reading intelligence summaries and reports uh, and assessments coming out of the US and speaking to people on the ground in Afghanistan um, at that time, as early as April 20th of April this year, um, it was quite clear to us that um, the government needed to prioritise um, the assessment of these individuals uh, and make sure that they were removed from uh, Afghanistan before the last uh, of the Australian troops were removed. So, uh, and we wrote in April, May, uh, I was down in Parliament in June, and we wrote again in July and early August, um, and there was no response from the government um, to those requests. So, uh, it was, we, we think it was really negligent of government to have left it that long, to have, have ignored um, the signs and indicators uh, and, and information that was there readily available. Uh, and it's now um, put people at significant risk. Um, Roxanne says, for Afghanistans in New South Wales wanting advice or assistance with visa forms, not specifically interpreters, um, to bring relatives, etc., you can refer them to Rax or legal aid yes it's a, a statement we've advised that in our yeah. grandmother newsletters um can i just say also if you if you have a look at the asrc they have they've set up a number of um other um migration agents that they have on board that are also assisting in that space and i think that'd be a really good resource um to put out to people as well great um have has Australia refused many visas to interpreters, to the Afghan interpreters that have worked with you or other staff that have worked yeah. with you? Yeah, yeah. look, there's, uh, there is, we, we believe that, that it's been, they've been very um, elusive on uh, numbers, on how many they've brought here, how many they've um, refused, how many applications have actually received and those type of figures. So we are uh, trying to obtain uh, more substantial data around that, but um, certainly, we have seen quite a few uh, rejections uh, come through where people uh, didn't meet the requirement. And this was really a failing of the government 
uh, first of all, to review the Lee uh, visa policy um, and also to make sure that the policy was able to, uh, was still, first of all, meeting um, the intent uh, of the policy, which was to protect those people um, from any uh, reprisals because of their association with Australian forces. Um, and it was, it was also uh, designed to make sure that their extended families were, uh, were not placed in any harm or risk as well. And I think the government has failed to review uh, the policy um, and they've failed to make sure that it was adaptable to the changing landscape in Afghanistan. And what we've seen the government uh, doing recently has been uh, they've essentially abandoned the Lee visa process. Uh, so anybody that has applied under that for an XB201 visa, which is a permanent residency visa, uh, the government have um, basically pushed them aside over to uh, an issued a 449 visa. Now they've done that to um, expedite uh, the extraction of those people Mm. Um, to out of uh, Afghanistan to be able to bring them to Australia. Uh, the argument that we have at the moment is the government should have been doing that all along. Mm. Um, as soon as somebody was identified by the Defence Minister as at significant risk of harm because of their service with Australian troops, they should have immediately been issued a 449 visa and brought out of Afghanistan and they could have pursued a pathway to uh, obtaining a 201 visa, which is a, a bit a lot more lengthy um, time to do that. Uh, they could have done that here in the safety of Australia. Instead, we left them um, swinging in the wind in Afghanistan, often for years, while the bureaucracy uh, here in Australia um, went round and round and round. And these people were living in fear and, and danger for years. And the reality is we should have been issuing 449 visas and getting them out immediately as soon as the Defence Minister had deemed them uh, as eligible and at risk. Mm. Um, I know I was one of the people at court with you um, when we went, and I th I understood at the end of that the um, problem with Hassan was just a technicality, more or less. It was just a you know a slight error, and things had changed. And Gabby's asked why has Hassan and his family constantly been refused a visa? Is it a question of the government being in its heels and not wanting to be seen to change their mind? Look, I uh, I um. You know, I, I have my own views on that. And I, I wrote to um, Minister Andrews uh, back in August uh, and asked why uh, Hassan's application uh, still had not been processed because I'd written uh, to um, the Home Affairs Minister back in June when Hassan was directly threatened. Um, and um, we, we wrote to uh, the minister then uh, requesting the immediate evacuation of Hassan and his young family. He has uh, an eight-month-old baby daughter now, um, very cute little girl. <laughs> and, you know, we, we asked for the immediate evacuation of him back then in June, um, and we still hadn't heard anything. Now, this decision from the full bench of the federal court was handed down in May 2020, and the federal court quashed uh, the minister's decision, and they directed the department to process Hassan's application in accordance with law. Um, we still, even with, um, you know, the advancing Taliban uh, and the dire concerns in Afghanistan and the fact that he'd been directly threatened in June, there was still no action from uh, the government on Hassan's application. And I wrote to them in early August and um, I, I basically said that uh, I'd written to them previously on numerous occasions and I'd not received a, a reply from the minister's office and I felt as a veteran that I was being ignored and uh, and I suggested that the uh, the fact that the Home Affairs Department hadn't processed um, Hassan's application um, had nothing to do with um, national security but more a degree of perhaps political interference or bias um, and it was only a week and a half after that that um, we got the negative response from um, the Home Affairs Minister denying uh, Hassan. And then it was only several days after that that he was issued uh, a 449 visa. And he then made his way to 
uh, the airport with his young family. And he was standing within metres of the bomb blast when it went off, um, within about 10 metres of the bomb blast. And, um, and then he, uh, he went back uh, to where he, was, where he was hiding and he decided that it was best for him to um, flee across the border into Pakistan, um, which he did with his family. Uh, and we were trying to get him uh, down to the Australian High Commission. Um, but Hassan's one of those people that falls into that category that doesn't have a passport. So for him to remain in Pakistan was also quite dangerous. Um, and for him to go down to Islamabad um, from where he was uh, would have also been quite dangerous as well because he didn't have um, a passport and he didn't have a visa. And if he went down into... Uh, Islamabad, he would have been asked for a Pakistan ID card uh, or a passport or visa. And if he didn't have any of those, he would have been arrested. So, um, you know, he's the, the situation is very difficult and it's very um, for these individuals to navigate, particularly if they don't have passports or visas. Um, thanks, Jason. There is a comment on here from Helen Esmond about helping um, Afghans in Australia through the Community Refugee Sponsorship of Refugees. If you'd like to read that on the um, at everyone, there's a website you can contact. Um, Jeffrey, yes, any contact I have, any contact I've had are advised to get their social media um, and use an encryption platform. Mm. So another yeah. comment. Yeah. Um, oh, that's me. I don't think we need to read me. <laughs> Which Australian parliamentarians are listening to you and trying to get action? That's from Helen at Esmond. Look, we've had um, the light of recent, the last few weeks, um, we've had uh, some contact with uh, Home Affairs and um, and certainly um, the Assistant Minister Jason Wood um, has been uh, has been quite good and and um, I've been able to talk with Jason uh, and some individuals at uh, Home Affairs. Uh, I've provided them details and lists, um, particularly those people that have uh, visa uh, that have valid visas and, and are remaining in Afghanistan. And I'm uh, getting uh, good information and advice from uh, from them. So I thank them uh, both for their assistance uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, with me as well. That's great. That was Jason Wood and who was the other you mentioned? Sorry, uh, Jason Wood and. Uh, a couple of individuals at home affairs. Individuals, I won't. Right. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's I, won't, fine. I don't want you to names, put them but, in the. <laughs> but look, they, um, you know, they've been working uh, very hard. Uh, Jason, I joined a Zoom meeting uh, with uh, that he was uh, chairing with a number of Afghan community leaders here in Australia a couple of weeks ago. Um, I spoke to him uh, a couple of days ago also, and um, and you know the, the department is seems to be working uh, quite hard on this issue, uh, and they understand the. Uh, urgency uh, behind it. Uh, so we hope to be able to keep working with them uh, to make sure we get as many people um, that we can uh, that are vulnerable out of Afghanistan and to safety. Great. Um, Gabby's asked, how many interpreters and others have been brought to Australia on permanent visas and how have they adapted to life in Australia? A few good yeah, ones up in Newcastle, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, look, there are. There's, uh, we've we've got um, solid little groups of the Afghan interpreters um, all over, and they they integrate pretty well um, into Australian culture. You know, we we're not very we don't go very easy on them over there um, when we're working with them. Um, we sort of throw them in the deep end, uh, you know, and a lot of them they understand our, um, you know, our first of all, I suppose our little uh, idiosyncrasies and our um, and those type of things, they really understand our sense of humour and stuff as well. Um, and uh, in the military, that, that can be pretty dark at times. Uh, but those guys are really good at, um, at at being able to have a laugh about things and not taking things. They learn not to take things too seriously. Um, and so they, they fit in quite well uh, into our communities. We have seen them uh, taking a long time to be able to get access to uh, things like um, their... Uh, Australian citizenship, uh, those times seem to have blown out uh, for those individuals. So it sees them waiting, not only their four years to be able to apply for their citizenship, but then waiting uh, could be up to an additional two years or more 
um, mm. before they get their Australian citizenship. And that puts a lot of restrictions on them and what they can and can't do in regards mm. to work and other uh, employment and other things like that. So um, to be able to fix that issue would be quite good for them as well. Yeah, I think that's part of a deliberate strategy, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, Roxanne, again, Jason, how do you... Sorry, do you have a recent in, any inf recent information about plans for further or permanent visas for the 449 visa holders currently in Australia? Um, visas expiring approximately mid-November. Yeah, look, the, the visas have a uh, an initial three month um, uh, date of which they're valid for after they've been issued, uh, and they're valid for three years once they've been actioned. So once they come to Australia, they're valid for for three years. Those 449 visas. Um, so a couple of things that we're pushing for with the interpreters, they would have normally been entitled to a 201 visa. So we're asking the government, we understand why they've issued 449s to get people out, but we're asking for the government to establish a pathway for those individuals to gain uh, their 201 permanent residency visa. Uh, and I believe that those people that have been issued 449 visas uh, that are still remaining in Afghanistan, um, those visas uh, will be honoured uh, is the reports and information I have from, um, from government is that those um, visas will be honoured. Um, so if they fall outside the three month period, uh, there will be extensions given to those that have been, that are in receipt of those visas and unable to get out. Great. Um, Michael McCormick, um, Jeffrey says has been listening a comment. Isabel has said, can you please say again what you're submitting to the Senate for tomorrow? Um, with what, what is your aim of this from Isabel? Yeah, look, I, our aim is to, um, I, I suppose, to try and improve um, the process. Uh, so moving forward to make sure that uh, we have a robust um, policy and process uh, in place uh, for any commitment of um, defence uh, personnel or resources where we require the assistance of, uh, of local nationals uh, to help us to make sure that we, we're not facing a similar uh, issue, issue or problem uh, like we have with the Afghanistan crisis. Um, it's also to draw attention uh, to the fact that we have over 600 uh, people still remaining in Afghanistan, um, 150 with valid visas. Um, and these are these are our most vulnerable people. Many of them wore the Australian combat uniform with our troops. Uh, and also to highlight uh, the fact that this is having a significant um, impact on our veteran community uh, because our veterans are great global citizens. Um, you know, we're known across the globe as uh, tough, uh, resilient, but compassionate fighters. Um, and this has really hit the uh, Afghan uh, veteran community I think quite hard because we understand that our job probably wasn't finished in Afghanistan. Um, it wasn't ready to, uh, to stand on its own. Um, the US, I think, uh, will look back on this, um, on their rapid withdrawal um, with, you know, some questions to be asked. And unfortunately, um, you know, we followed uh, suit and, you know, we, we couldn't remain there by ourselves. We couldn't keep our troops there by ourselves either. Um, so, you know, but I think the US will look back on this, on that hasty withdrawal uh, and uh, what's unfolded in, Afgh in Afghanistan over the last couple of months uh, with deep regret. And, um, and you know, it, uh, it doesn't serve the, the people of Afghanistan at the moment, but we certainly want to make sure that we can try and help uh, any of those that remain and that assisted us uh, to draw attention to the issue um, and uh, the I suppose the collateral damage is um, our, our veterans that are being dragged along uh, with this as well. So we really want to draw, I suppose, first of all, the, the purpose of the Senate uh, submission is to draw attention to the impact on our veteran community, uh, to draw attention to the fact we still have many that are remaining um, and to draw attention to uh, the issues and deficiencies uh, with the Lee Visa program and policy and how do we fix those um, moving forward to make sure that we're not facing a similar uh, issue uh, in future areas where we might commit our defence personnel and require local nationals. Yeah, doesn't give them confidence. Mm. Um, 
He's asked as a group at Grandmas for Refugees and as individuals, um, is there a way, a particular way that we can, um, whoop, just disappeared, a particular way that we can take the government to talk to the government and get them to listen to us? How many are there in your Forsaken Fighters team, apart from you and your wife? <laughs> yeah, look, there's, uh, there's only uh, a couple of us. We are a very small um, charity. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we, we are, uh, there's about uh, seven or eight of us um, that are sort of working on, on this, but uh, we are a very small um, charity. Uh, I do a lot of the, the heavy lifting when it comes to things like media interviews and, um, you know, uh, discussions and those type of things and the drafting of documents. And uh, because I have that connection uh, on the ground with the uh, interpreters, and I know a lot of them and I've been tracking them for years. Um, so I've been collecting their data and verifying them and trying to assist them uh, for years. Um, you know, I'm sort of running the, uh, the social groups and trying to keep those individuals informed. Um, but one of the biggest, I, I suppose, challenges we have is making sure that we manage um, their expectations as well. Um, there's a lot of pleas uh, for immediate assistance and, and those type of things and uh, beyond uh, financial, providing financial support um, where we can, um, there's not a lot immediately that we can do. So it's trying to manage the um, expectation of those uh, people and their family groups to try and give them some confidence to um, remain where they are or um, give them the tools that they need uh, to do that and, um, and manage their expectations that no process here or, or any pathway that we take is going to be immediate um, or, or a quick fix. So we have to really try and um, get them down to that uh, level of, of understanding and thinking as well uh, that um, the Australian government isn't going to charter an aircraft and get it into HKIA to pull out one person. Um, you know, uh -huh. And coordinating those individuals is, is quite difficult as we've seen uh, with the evacuation operations as well. So um, it's really trying to manage your expectations takes a lot of time as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, Isabel says, thank you very much for the clear explan explanation. And Al says, is your father and your, your lovely father-in-law still part of the team? He, he, is, uh, he is still part of the team. He's a Vietnam veteran and, um, and he's still, still there as part of the team. He'll still chew the ear off, uh, off anyone. So he's pretty good at that, but um, he is still there with us. So we're, we're very grateful to still have him there helping well, Jason, and advocating. Sorry, I was just going to say our time is up. Thank you so much. And I have so much admiration for you. And yes. um, I'll hand you back, Gabby. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Jason. Um, look, at you, you have so much information there and it's great for us to sort of learn from you. Is there anything that we can do as a group you know, lobbying, parliament, yeah. our local MPs, or just social media? Yeah, look, I, I guess, um, <laughs> I guess uh, yeah, you know, um, following us on social media and, and being able to share our, uh, our information and our, um, our posts and concerns, um, you know, and the support from uh, the Grandmothers for Refugees has been um, awesome. It's been very inspiring for us, particularly when, I went down to uh, Sydney for the federal court uh, action um, early last year. And it was just so great to have um, a group of purple shirts there, um, yeah. you know, supporting us. And, um, and we just felt uh, really um, grateful to have that sort of support there. But um, look, if you, if you can't, I always tell people, some of the things that you've got to understand is um, you've got to understand your own weaknesses. Right. Um, my my weaknesses are um, first of all asking for help and asking for money. Um, yeah. I, I've been I was brought up in the country. We don't do neither of those things, um, <laughs> and so um, I've sort of been very reluctant um, to ask for help or ask for money. Um, but obviously, with the situation and the amount of people that we do have, uh, it's something that I can't do on my own. Um, so I do ask that uh, if people, if even if you can't uh, donate, if you can share. Um, our page or our campaigns uh, that's also very helpful um, even if you can't donate yourself uh, being able to share it uh, it gets the message out and then it may find somebody who is uh, in a position to donate as well so there are ways that we can we can help 
those remaining in Afghanistan uh, right now to get that direct financial aid into them. Uh, we don't pay any uh, directors. Uh, we don't pay any, I don't get paid. Um, yeah. Everything I do is for the love of it uh, here at Forsaken Fighters. Um, I'd even assist the government uh, free of charge so it wouldn't cost the taxpayer a cent if they wanted, wanted me to. So, um, but yeah, certainly um, I don't take any, uh, any of those funds. We're not a big charity, so we're not paying wages or director's fees or anything like that. Uh, every cent we get goes uh, back into helping those in the Afghan community. So Yeah, well, that's something we can definitely put the um, word out. So, look, thank you so much, Jason, and I'm sure we'll be, we'll be following what you're doing and we'll also, yeah. I'm sure, be calling on you again in the future for um, yeah. an update. And, look, I just so hope Hassan and his, I think, he's, is he three children or four children? He's got four now. He's got three oh. young boys and a, and a little baby. Yeah, so look, we just hope that, you know, there's a better outcome from him, but we'll definitely follow um, what's going on. So thank you so much, yeah, um, Jason, until the next time. Okay. No Thanks. worries. Thanks very much for your support. Okay. Thank you very bye. much. Thanks. Okay, so bye, everybody. So have you got all the links?